for joining me today for the latest in our Global Mapper tutorial series. Today we're going to talk about gridding in the context of transforming a vector layer, specifically in this case a LiDAR layer, into a raster layer, generating a surface, generating a terrain layer. Um, this is one of the more important procedures in Global Mapper, the ability to transform, uh, again, basic point data, point cloud data, into a raster version of that data that allows you to conduct all of the raster analysis procedures, generate contours, view shed, watershed analysis, etc. So this procedure is at the core of a lot of different workflows. And again, as it's the case in many uh, components of Global Mapper, it is very straightforward. So I have loaded a point cloud already. I've even filtered it already just to keep this procedure as straightforward as possible. What we're looking at on the screen now are just over a million points, a relatively small point cloud. You can see in my control center the summary of the contents of the layer. And all of these points represent ground. So we've removed all of the non-ground points. The procedure uh, for creating our surface, for initiating the gridding process, uh, is, is uh, carried out using the button in my toolbar, the Create Elevation Grid button, as you can see, a little colored mountain, as you can see here. Um, bringing up the options, you'll see there are a few things we can choose in terms of uh, how to create this grid, a few settings we can apply. First, as you can see, is the option to create a name for this new layer. This will be a raster layer, as we've said. Uh, you will notice that it will take the name of the original layer. In my case, I've got a layer called Sample LiDAR, and use that as the basis for this. I would strongly encourage you to override this and make it a little more meaningful. So I'm just going to call this one Terrain, or you can obviously name it relative to a project or something that you're working on in, in your situation. Um, you can also define the units. Um, I'm going to leave that as meters. The grid method gives us a drop down. Now, we're going to use a very simple procedure for this example. We're going to use the triangulation process. And I'll describe in a minute what, what that means. But you'll notice there are three alternatives, binning options. Those require the LiDAR module. While they will, will be displayed, even if you don't have the LiDAR module, when you try to initiate one of the binning options, it will tell you, I'm sorry, you do not have the LiDAR module and it will not be available. Binning is a procedure whereby you can define a an area within which you're going to look for the min, max, or average, and from that generate a surface. It'll give you, theoretically, it will give you a, a, a ground surface, a DTM that more specifically adheres to where ground points are. We're going to cover that one in another session for today. We're going to keep this simple and we're going to use the triangulation method. Now triangulation um, is a procedure that addresses the elevation values associated with every point and essentially generates a series of triangles, interlocking triangles. We have the option, as you can see in the dialog box, to save that triangulated network as a vector layer. Uh, I'm actually going to uncheck this in this case, but certainly if you want to look at this procedure yourself, you can check that option. It's going to be a fairly large layer, lots of vector polygons, triangular vector polygons interlocking. But it's very interesting. You can look at that as a 3D model, a gridded model, if you like. Um, we're not going to have that as our byproduct today, but you do have that as an option. But that triangulation process is the first phase of transforming this point data into a raster layer. The second is taking that uh, vector tin and using it as the basis for assigning specific elevation values to pixels in our target layer. So we're going to, this is going to be a multi-step process. We're going to do it in one procedure. We're not going to worry about addressing uh, the tin. Um, the grid spacing can be defined as well. Now, more often than not, you'll want to leave this automatic. This is going to be derived from the spacing within your point cloud. So if you want to get some information about what that spacing is, you can look at the metadata. Um, right click on the layer in the overlay control center and look at metadata. In this case, having looked at this previously, my average spacing in this layer is about 50 centimeters. So the pixel size in the corresponding raster layer will be about 50 centimeters as well. If I want to override that, I can specify a resolution for my target data. If my project requires me to create a elevation layer that has a one meter uh, horizontal resolution, I can define that right here by putting a, a more appropriate value in. Again, I'm going to leave the default as it is right now to automatically assign this.
Now the next setting is one that causes some confusion or we do get some questions about. There's a slider bar here that lets you move this a little slider all the way from tight to loose. Now, there is a description as to what exactly this is doing, but to summarize, we're addressing the uh, procedure about dealing with gaps in your data. Now, in my point cloud, there are a couple of noticeable gaps here. Areas where when, when vegetation was removed, perhaps, it left some holes in my point cloud. This slider allows us to determine how to address these holes. By leaving this further over towards the loose side, the process will bridge those gaps, essentially create larger triangles that enclose these null areas. That would be the procedure that you would perform on the assumption that if you remove the trees or vegetation or buildings or whatever it is you have filtered out, that the ground continues underneath. We're creating an interpolated representation of where ground would be in the absence of actual points. Keeping the slider towards loose will do that for us. Moving it towards tight will respect the holes and leave those areas null in the raster layer. You will essentially have holes in your data. And that may be something you want to do. If there's no data there, you'd want to make an assumption that uh, the points around the edge correspond with elevations in the middle. You can leave that out. You'll have holes, as I said, in your elevation layer. In this example, I'm going to move my slider towards the loose side, again, on the, on the expectation that I want to have a, a solid surface without any gaps. There are a few other options underneath as well. I mentioned the saving the tin, which I'm not going to do. If we have uh, data which is obviously invalid, invalid, zero elevations, we're going to ignore those if this is checked. I know that's not the case in this layer. Fitting, uh, fill the entire bounding box instead of a uh, inside a convex hull. If my point cloud was an irregular shape, this option would create a, or sorry, was an irregular shape, it was not a rectangle. This option would fill in and create an MBR, a minimum bounding rectangle, to create a rectangular model, if you like. Um, and we do have the option to directly export to a GMG file, our own proprietary elevation format, Global Mapper Grid. This bypasses the rendering, or at least it removes one step and automatically exports that if that's necessary. Now, as with many of these procedures in Global Mapper, many of the analysis and data export options, you will see two recurring tabs. One is tiling and the other is grid bounds. Tiling allows you to define uh, an array of tiles instead of generating just one grid. You can define exactly how many subsets you need. Maybe you want to manage the data in a much more efficient way. It's too large for a single file, uh, so you'll bring it down and you, you have options here for defining the tiling. Grid bounds lets you constrain the extent. So maybe your point cloud covers more area than you're interested in. Many ways of defining what that geographic extent is. Perhaps the most common towards the bottom here is to crop to a selected polygon. Obviously not relevant in my workflow, but if I had a polygon, perhaps representing the extent of my project, I just wanted the grid inside that polygon. I would first select it with the digitizer tool before opening in the dialog box. This would then be active. I could then constrain that, that uh, grid to that area. Again, not relevant for our workflow today. So basically we're going with the defaults here. Um, again, keeping the slider towards loose, we'll click OK and it's addressing every point. And you can see now we have created a terrain surface. We have a new layer in our overlay control center, our terrain layers here. This is now a raster layer. It's a raster layer that's a little bit different than an image layer where we look at, for instance, satellite imagery, which has a consistent color applied per pixel. The values that we have assigned to the pixels in this, in this layer are elevation values. And you can see a dynamic display of those. If I look down towards the bottom of my screen, of course, I move my cursor away. But if you keep your eye on the bottom left corner of my screen while I move my cursor around, you'll notice the height is now represented dynamically as I move around. And just to verify that this is indeed a terrain layer, I want to pop up my 3D view. And you can see this now displayed in all its 3D glory. So that workflow, transitioning from a vector layer, specifically a point layer, which in my case was a LiDAR layer, into this raster surface, now gives us the raw material that allows us to conduct all sorts of terrain analysis procedures in Global Mapper, from contour generation, as I said before, right through watershed analysis, etc. So again, very quick look at
creating a terrain surface, or gridding in Global Mapper.